of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Good evening. Let me just uh, get myself signed on. No, just God. I'd like to ask that we um, observe a moment of silence for the following individuals. Uh, Donald E. Pike, a North Syracuse Central School District graduate. Dolores M. Beamer, a retired employee of the North Syracuse Central School District. Latif R. Haskins, a 1984 graduate of the North Syracuse Central School District. And Horace Morris a North Syracuse Central School District graduate. Thank you. Our first presentation is Smith Road Elementary School BPT presentation. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everybody. Hi, how are you? Good evening. Yeah, you should oh, have the microphone. The camera. Oh, I should have known. Okay. Thank you. Great. It's my debut. <laughs> yeah, don't, uh, don't let it make you nervous. Okay. So thank you for having us. On behalf of Smith Road staff and faculty, um, Lindsay Maloney, this is um, my BPT chair extraordinaire is what I like to refer to Lindsay as. She's um, extremely helpful. She is our BPT chair. She has been our BPT chair since before I um, arrived. So I owe a lot of thanks to Lindsay. She helps keeps, uh, keep us on track and organized all the time. Okay, here we go. Smith Road. This is where we... Um, have been. Just so you know, we have combed through every single bit of data that you could possibly have on all of our children from the past several years to determine where we have been and um, where we need to go and then make determinations about how we are going to get there. So let's take a look first of all um, uh, on some historical data on our grade three <laughs> ELA and math results. Of course, we're a, gay, a grade K through four buildings, so our assessments, state assessments, start at grade three. This is the first year they've ever taken a state assessment, so it's a lot of prep work to get them to this point. If you take a look at the um, historical data that is on the graphs right now, you can see the blue is all students, the red is our students with disabilities, and the green is um, our students with economically disadvantaged. Take a look at the blue and you can see that we increase in scores in our ELA from one year to the next starting in 2010 going to 2011 and then last year 2012. So hats off to my grade three team because this is the first time they've ever taken any uh, state assessments and the same you can see at grade three math. However, if you take a look at our subgroups, the red is our students with disabilities. In our building this year, we have 107 students with disabilities out of our population of 507. So you can see that we need to do some altering um, in our teaching and strategies to help meet the needs of all of our children. The rate of improvement hasn't been as rapid with students with disabilities as it has with other students over the years. And so some of our teaching strategies have to um, be addressed. Take a look at the next slide. This is where we've been with grade four. Once again, the blue is all students. The red are students with disabilities. And the uh, green is our economically disadvantaged population. Again, you can see our 
increase in the past couple of years with all students. You can see an increase with all of our subgroups at some point, but not consistently at any of our subgroups. So once again, we have to look at this is where we've been, why, and what are we going to do about it, knowing that our subgroups are a very large population, um, you, you know, a large portion of our population in our school. So that's where we've been over the past few years. But where do we need to go? So we took a look at all of our historical data and we set some goals based on a couple of things. At the top in blue, you see the, where it's written SRE SMART goals. SMART goals are um, the goals that we set based on our students and where they need to go, our population. They're SMART meaning um, strategic, measurable, attainable, result-oriented and time-bound. So we have to look at how much can we actually accomplish in one year based on our students' needs. We also took the students, um, the district race to the top goals and made that our, our overall arching goals, obviously, but then we have to base it on how much improvement can we show with our subgroups as well. So if you take a look at K through two, the district race to the top goal is 82% of our students will meet on-level reading goals. At kindergarten, this is up to a level C with the Fountas and Pinnell screening. At first grade, it's up to a level J on target for Fount with Fountas and Pinnell screening. And second grade is level M with the Fountas and Pinnell screening. Knowing that some of our students are starting these grade levels far below where, where we had anticipated they would end last year, the hope is to have students increase by one year's growth starting from where they entered that grade level. So will 82 of our percent, percent of our students be on grade level by the end of the year? That's our overall goal, but all students can reach at least one year's growth. At grades three and four, you can take a look. Um, our ELA, the goal for this year, it remains the same as last year. That's where we were last year. 64% of our students showed proficiency at grade three ELA, and 65 is the same for math although this would be um, a, a big increase for us. This is a lofty goal for us, for our students with disabilities. 35% um, passing the ELA would be, we would need to increase by 29%. That's not cohort data though, that's grade level data, because obviously this cohort hasn't had last year's, you know, there was no ELA in second grade. So that's based on last year's performance of students with disabilities. A 35% would be a lofty increase for us. Same thing with grade four. 67% is the district race to the top goal. Last year we had 68% of our fourth graders attain proficiency, so we would hope to have 68% as well. Um, and last year, 64% of our third graders, so if you look at the cohort, that's a small increase, but we, we would hope to get to that because the cohort is, is right around there. Once again, um, we have some lofty goals for our students with disabilities because that would in ELA, we would have to increase by 15% uh, of what we did last year to reach that 35% goal. And with math, we would have to increase by 16% to reach the math. That's based on grade level data though, not cohort data, okay? So if that's where we need to go in this school year and we're already 10 weeks in, where are we right now? This is what we've combed through this data many, many, many times at each grade level to see where are we right now and how are we going to reach those goals. So at kindergarten, we looked at um, letter naming fluency and letter sound fluency. This, this is not a big concern for us because these students have not learned this yet. This is what you come to kindergarten expecting to learn. So looking at the, um, the green is students who are in good standing the yellow is students who are approaching, you know, on grade level standing, and the red are students that we may be concerned about. But once again, when they come to kin kindergarten, we would assume that they haven't learned letters or sounds yet. So th this is not a concern. Also, we administered a, a baseline uh, kindergarten entry test about letter naming, letter sound, and um, high frequency sight words. So that test is administered in September. It's also administered in November for parent reports and then it's administered again in January to see if we should provide any AIS services. We also use this information to um, um, create a list of students who will you know, receive uh, literacy volunteer services. Of course, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
where we are at grade one right now. I use two different data points because we can't just look at one test to see where students are and where they need to go. And we can't just measure their performance by one test at the end of the year either. So if we take a look at the Fountas and Pinnell reading, um, I'm going to focus mostly on reading for grades K1, 2 because we're just teaching them how to read at this grade level. The goal at the end of kindergarten is for students to be reading on the level C according to Fountas and Pinnell. But if you take a look at this graph, 11% um, of our students were reading on level C when they entered first grade. 31% of them were reading above level C when they entered first grade this year. So 42% of our, our <coughs> students currently in September and October were at or above grade levels, but 58% of our students at first grade came from kindergarten not reading on grade level. So you can see we have a lot of work to do in first grade to get kids caught up because the goal is to get them to level J. The question is, will they all be at level J? That's our goal, but can they all increase by a year's growth? Yes, they can. So that's why it's going to take us some different data points to show what growth they make by the end of the year. Fontes and Pinnell will be our, um, our main target, though, for, le for uh, level J. Math, we, gave, we administered the um, Ames Web um, um, computation. 55% of our students uh, are, are pretty solid in computation, but again, they tested some skills that they hadn't been taught yet. Um, the math comp at grade one was a group test. Yeah. Once again, they hadn't taken those kinds of tests like that, so, so we'll do it again in January and we'll do it again in May. Okay, here's where we are at grade two. Remember that the goal at the end of grade one is to have students reading at level J. Um, and the goal at the end of grade two is to have students reading at level M. Currently, when we administered this Fountains and Pinnell screening, which is administered to um, each student individually, um, we found that 16% of our students were at level J, 35% of our students were above level J, and then you can see where we're at 45% of our students below reading level J. So will they get to level M? Many of them will get to level M, but can they increase by four to six reading levels, more importantly, is what we'll have to measure at the end of the year because that's a year's growth for these kids depending on where they started. Um, a, an important thing to note too is the planning and um, the assessing for these students. In any given classroom, students are reading anywhere from level A to level N at this time of the year. So there's a huge wide range in terms of you know guided reading and guided grouping. At second grade, we administered the um, math applications and the math computation. Some of the skills hadn't been taught yet, but they were tested that, uh, and we, we used the um, Ames Web to um, set targets for the end of the year for the teachers' SLOs as well. How are we going to get there is the bigger question. Um, we did a lot of brainstorming. I'll let you just take a look at this list for a minute, but some of the things I'd like to key <coughs> in on are the co-planning, the co-teaching, and the co-assessing. At every grade level, we have at least, um, well, not at least, we have two at every grade level inclusive classes. So they're co-planning and co-assessing and co-teaching with a um, general education teacher and a special education teacher. Um, the co-planning and the co-teaching piece is, is key for where the students need to go, but the co-assessing piece is also key because we have to be able to look back at the assessments in order to plan to go forward. So you can see the time that it takes to do that with those grade level teachers. Um, we also are talking about the co-planning piece with our ALES and all their service providers because they can't be learning, students, students who are coming in below level now can't be learning different skills based on the class that they go to, whether it's a push in or pull out. They have to be, there has to be some congruency. So the co-planning piece is want to talk about that and I also want to talk about the connection the cross-curricular connection our um, librarian our library media specialist has done above and beyond in terms of assessing student reading levels so that she can help when students come to library so they're taking books at their level so they can read on their own and also books that somebody at home can read to them that's been a, a big change for us this year and building background activities um, using pictures, using smart board activities, using the technologies that are in place in the schools, um, and diagnostic teaching. Find out when you have your small groups, what are students' skill weaknesses, and how can I address them with small groups within small groups? And then um, you know, teaching small groups with 
several adults in place at the same time. Um, one thing I wanted to point out too on the math side for our skills is doing some how-to training with parents. We often hear parents say, that's not the way we did it when I was in school. Um, the vocabulary is different, the how we teach it is different, and so training parents how to help their children at home is a key component in our, um, our parent support. So K-1-2, we focus on literacy. Let's take a look at where we are now with grades three and four. I didn't do the charts the same way, but I did pull out the same information. Let's just take a look at grade three for a minute. At grade three last year, we had 64% of our students reach the proficiency level at ELA. Currently though, the kids who are now in third grade, we gave them the Fountas and Pinnell screening. We gave that to each student individually at the beginning of the year. At this point, 39% of them are reading at level M or above. And so you can see we have a long way to go because the rest of them are below level M according to Foundas and Pinnell screening at the beginning of this year. So we have to do more Foundas and Pinnell screening mid-year and end of year. We're using some um, intervention strategies in the classroom in terms of how to support our students in smaller groups, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Take a look at the grade three math. Last year we had 65% of our students re reach proficiency. Currently, we just gave in November, the beginning of this month, we just gave the new, um, North Syracuse um, benchmark assessment for math. 50% of our students attained a score of 50% or higher. So while that might look a little low, the good news is, according to predictions from Ames Webb and how we set our teacher SLOs, that's 50% of our students who are already on target to you know, reach proficiency for the math. So, so that's a good sign for us. Take a look at grade four. Last year we had 68% proficiency in ELA. This year currently we have 24%, that's a quarter of our students reading at or above grade level, um, Fountas and Pinnell level P. So we have a long way to go to get with our grade four uh, students. However, those are the same students who met proficiency at 64% when they were in third grade on the ELA. Take a look at our grade four, 2012 math. 77% of our students reached proficiency. We haven't done a current benchmark for this um, group of students, but that's being given at the first week in December district-wide for all of our fourth graders. We did give the math Ames web though, so teachers have that to go on. Um, when we created our AIS groups, we used the Fountas and Pinnell and we used the Ames web assessment data to create the AIS grouping. How we get there with grades three and four. Um, I want to just, you can take a look at the list of strategies. Of course, every strategy isn't used for every group or every classroom, but this was a, a, a lot of brainstorming with a lot of, of minds in the rooms, um, especially through our BPT groups. But a couple of things I wanted to uh, look at were time on task. Take a look at the third bullet under the ELA, nonfiction test, text used in um, reading instruction it is really important because we can't possibly have an hour for math, an hour for social studies, an hour for science, an hour for you know penmanship. So we have to take those hours and somehow condense them. So in order to get the content area information in, we have to use the guided reading text during our reading instruction so we can focus on the ELA, um, ELA skills using content area books at students' reading levels. So we're taking a, a long look at that. We do have all of our materials well organized at this point, and we're looking at um, reading informational text, which is another one of those skills um, listed under the ELA, reading informational text at various levels, reading levels. Um, once again, we have to look at common writing assessments. We're using common scoring rubrics so that we can see um, that students are being assessed the same or similar in every class, depending so it won't depend on which teacher you have, they're being administered the same test and, and the same rubric for writing. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention was, um, we have a tutoring program that's funded with our Title I monies. I, I, I do think we have to look at what skills are being serviced or served or, or met in the tutoring program. Um, and we did, two years ago, focus our tutoring on the LLI program, one size did not, does not fit all, so last year we changed the skills and we group students by skill ability levels for the tutoring program, so we'll do that again 
and we have more assessment data that we can use this year than we did last year and finally we we also have students already who have testing accommodations and modifications we already have them grouped with the person who will administer their test so they get used to testing with the same person and where because they get pulled out of their classroom to be administered for the test administration so so we have the same place and the same person administering tests like science and social studies right now so they can prepare for for the May assessment of math and ELA The other thing is, can you tell me about the push to math support? Is that done by? Uh, yeah, we have right now. Um, we have our um, resource teacher at fourth grade is doing push in small groups in the fourth grade. Um, she doesn't push into all the classes though because some of the classes have an inclusive or blended program or blended teacher that pushes in with them. So it could come from an AIS group. It could come from a resource group. It could come from a blended teacher that's co-teaching with that class. Okay. It's, um, it's been a shift in some thinking, but it's been a lot of brainstorming with, like I said, a lot of minds in the room. Okay. Professional development, um, this is a, about collaboration and how will we grow together. The conversations have shifted over the years in my short time here um, about helping each other. A couple of things that were already in place, they already, we already had um, um, early release time, meaning once a month we have coverage for the classroom teachers so that they can do their planning together. We've changed the early release time to follow the BPT meeting week because BPT is our data-driven instructional team. So BPT sets the agenda for the early release meetings, which meets the following week after that. And that's been, that's been a, a, a change in our scheduling this year. Um, a couple other things. We do, we're going to use some of our Title I funding to do some building professional capacity about um, students who come from cultures of poverty. Um, Donna Johnson, one of our, our counselors, is going to lead us in a book discussion, so that's something that's new and different for us this year. Um, and I would hope to be able to send teachers into each other's classrooms, because even though they teach right next to each other, they don't always know what goes on in each other's classrooms, and that's one of the best ways that we can learn and grow, is to look at each other teach. Finally, our community involvement. I, I have to give a plug for Smith Road, because when we had our Halloween party not too long ago, um, we had 39 um, National Honor Society students come and volunteer at our school. And we have a great connection with our National Honor Society students. They're great kids. They come and do a lot of work with us at our school. But one of the parents that came to the door came with no children and she said, Mrs. Clark, would you mind if I come in? And she said, I don't have a student here, but I do live in the community. And my daughter is a National Honor Society student, and I've heard nothing but great things about your school, so could I come in and see how things go here? Because I hear you do a lot of events for the kids at night. So she did, and I thought that was a great hats off to our parent group who's done lots of organizing. And um, um, we try to do something once a month, one night a month for our students to participate in. Um, we have our literacy um, events, we have our, our tree lighting ceremony, our Halloween parties, and we do have a huge turnout. We have a lot of parents who come and volunteer and work with our teachers as well. Um, we have a community service program going on right now um, with the rescue mission. We have many po parent volunteers, including our ELV uh, elves program, our early literacy volunteers. We have a grandparent program. We have an HSO, that's our home school, um, for anybody who doesn't know, it's our parent group. Um, we have a whole new set of parents who have funded field trips for every grade level last year, so we have a lot of community involvement and we have um, a lot of support from our parents. And um, that's it. So that's where we are. Do you have any questions? Very impressive. Very ambitious. It's very ambitious. But like I said, our conversations have, have changed and grown. And um, we have we have needs that needs to be, need to be met, and that's you know that's been good for our staff to become a little more united. I just had a comment about Miss Maloney. Um, to be involved like you are with this program, which I I'm in your building a little bit. As a phys ed teacher, I'm impressed that you are doing activities for ELA. I, I, every time I go in, I see what chart you have up. This young lady relates the curriculum every day to her phys ed students, whether it's math 
or it's e l a you just have to walk in to see what she does with those students she relates what's happening in the classroom in her fit in her gymnasium it's a met magnificent do agree thank you thank you Cox middle I'm Dave Shaw. I'm principal at Rocks Middle. For those of you who haven't met me, I uh, started in May. had an opportunity to present late last year. Um, here now with my team, Jenny Sullivan and Kelly Flaherty, who's part of our BPT, our BPT chair. Um, when I started, um, my predecessor, Jim Shapiler, who had been uh, principal at FM High School for about 20 years, um, gave, a, gave kind of a farewell speech to the staff and made comment that uh, it's a very, very strong staff in the building. But he felt like there was a uh, scattershot, if you will, of, of program of delivery of education in the building. And uh, with all the strength in the building, he didn't understand why it was so all over the place. And, and after my time here, one thing I've really worked on is building unity of approach and education and, and pride and, and all those sorts of things, really having one focus as a building, whether it's our reading program, our math program, our behavioral uh, components as well. And so our BPT has been working very hard uh, on that. So I'll let Jenny start us off with our presentation. Here. Hi, I'm Jenny Sullivan. I teach sixth grade at Rockford Road <coughs> Middle School, and um, I'm happy to be here. And I just wanted to say thank you for inviting us and we're going to share a lot of data with you but I want to remind everybody that although data is very important and it is driving our instruction our building is full of students and full of parents and full of teachers who and promote success with our group of students um, so we wrote our goals like we're really working on in all of our classroom to use our I can statements every day when the classrooms they know what's going to be expected of them because the I can statements are posted in each classroom. We wrote our goals as we can statements. So you can see we're going to work on fluency, understanding number sense, incorporating the habits of mind, and the APPR cycle. So over the summer, we the BPT met on several occasions, and we had the pleasure of working with Donna Marie Norton also, who helped us go through all of our data and really dive in and analyze it and look at it and pull it apart and put it back together and we really took all of that data and created the goals that we're going to share with you in a minute um, we took a look at the strap plan and we made connections to goal one and we're going to talk right now about how we're going to work on our academic goals chart shows the um, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students um, with their Ames Web, our CBM measure, and our goal is going to be to move them, the green group, up into the 80s. Um, right now we have um, the fifth grade considerably below the red, or um, the red, and um, so our goal is to work with those kids on their fluency and push them up into, into 80s and drop the, the red. Sixth grade is in a little better, a um, close, little closer to our goal, and seventh grade is kind of easy. Similar information presented in a slightly different way here. We have our, our tiers, which you may be familiar with the triangles by now from Ames Webb. You've probably seen them in some fashion or another. The top triangle is the uh, fifth grade as a whole. The green category is, is what we want to be the largest. That's where we'd like to see our 80%. Uh, right there, you can see it's 43.6%. Uh, uh, again, we have a, quite a way to go there. Uh, the yellow is our tier two, and uh, the red is our tier one. Of course, we'd like to minimize students at the top and push them into the green. Underneath is our fifth grade students with disabilities, which is actually doing uh, better. Uh, and that's a little subgroup there. Something we're going to be keeping a close eye on, but even that we want to be up at 80% as well. 
as we move up to the sixth grade, you can see that pattern continues. Checking to soak that in. Again, that 55% in the green would like to push up to an 80 uh, over the next few years here. What will be nice about this is you'll be able to see the progression from fall to winter to spring. And as that happens, we want to see that green area grow and grow and grow. Seventh grade cohort. Again, looking fairly similar, uh, but we do want to see that green area rise. So what we did after the BPT met on several occasions, we shared with the staff our findings of the data that we had looked at. And we worked on the October 31st half day in small groups and all the, the teachers were decided to focus as a building on fluency because we felt with fluency, fluency obviously will build better readers and with better readers comes comprehension. So we're focusing on fluency throughout the building <coughs> and we came up with the five different strategies that you can see on the right hand side of the screen that every teacher in the building has agreed to and has agreed to working on. More data. This is the actual state test scores. Uh, give you three years there, and you can see uh, something of uh, hovering around 50%, depending on the grade level, depending on the year. Uh, we are our 2015 target is pushing up to 80%. We would like to see gradual growth getting up towards that direction. Same thing for math. In a few seconds. So we also looked at our math data and. The good news is that we spent a lot of time having great conversations on the 31st all about our ELA scores and our fluency scores, but the bad news is that did not allow us time to talk about our math strategies. So the building as a whole has looked at the data that we've collected with the Ames website and the New York State test, and so we're going to be focusing on number sense, and then I, we kind of added a little information here about what we mean when we say number sense, like how numbers work together, how you can pull them apart, how they put together, like you know, the patterns of numbers. And with a better sense of numbers, the kids would be able to use those strategies to pull apart problem solving tasks that they're asked to do. And we're going to be working on this on December 11th is our next half day, and that day we're gonna do it. And again, our math data here. Uh, numbers are a little bit higher, hovering around uh, mid 60s. Um, Again, our target is a little bit higher here. We're looking for an 85%. Overall, we're looking to just have that gradual, regular growth go across the board. Something else we've already started at uh, Roxborough Middle School is our Habits of Mind program. This was actually begun last year before I arrived, so we're in something of a phase two right now. Um, just like with our English and our math strategies, we're looking for unity in how we deal with situations and uh, character education program. We don't want a student going out for one teacher and one set of standards and the principal having a different set of standards altogether. Furthermore, we'd like to have similar language throughout the building. It's helpful when a student hears that same thing over and over and over again, particularly if it's a student. Uh, the Habits of Mind program is, is something we've worked on in the building. Many of our staff have been trained, but we're going to be continuing that training wide, uh, but it does talk about strategic reasoning, insightfulness, uh, really thinking about your thinking, uh, sort of a depth of thought, not just why did you act this way, but what other ways could you have uh, made decisions in the process here, and what, uh, what options were at your, at your fingers. There's, this, we're kind of in phase two right now. Uh, we've got student-led announcements that discuss these habits of mind. Uh, so in their own words and projecting out to the students. Uh, our courtyard with Bill Irwin, he's, he's working with the Habits of Mind. Uh, even our PTO, we're going to have working with them. And of course, this is highly connected to our strategic plan. Uh, we are not only increasing our engagement levels with students, but we are going to be measuring uh, student discipline, attendance rates. Uh, we have a system of rewards, gotcha, we did this morning on the announcements, uh, which is playing a winner uh, out of all the students who had received a, a little gotcha reward, a positive reward for doing something good. Backpack for Roxborough Middle to, to the winner. 
well as our, our third goal in the strategic plan, empowering the families and getting that connection with the families. Our PTO has done a fantastic job. I'm sure our president, Denise Gerbsch, is watching. Her, certainly. Uh, from coming where I started last year, not being sure if we would even have a PTO, the first meeting this year where we had 20 parents show up, back to school barbecue, which was a, an incredible success. Pancake breakfast up at Applebee's. These are two events I didn't think I would be seeing this year. So I'm really excited about that. And that's all due to our board, of which we have a full board. So we're ecstatic about the PTO, but getting them really connected with the school in meaningful ways, getting the families in. The last thing that we wanted to share with you tonight was um, how we're planning to build the teacher capacity around the APPR system. Um, but not only the APPR system, but we also are incorporating all of the Common Core standards. Imagine it's been a very stressful time, not only for the teachers, but for the administrators, and I know for many of the district. Um, with that in place, we're connecting that to the strategic plan. And what we've decided to do as a building is really open up a two-way system of communication. We worked on that 31st on the half-day seminar. We did a very short presentation in front of the whole staff, kind of reminding them of the cycle of the APPR. And at our school right now, we've had four coffee talks already, and the coffee talks are before school and after school. And people come and we talk about the APPR system and what it means and how it works. And people are sharing their lesson plans with each other and, you know, editing and copying and looking at what's good and what's bad and really diving into the rubrics to decide, you know, what is the rubric asking us to do and how are we showing what we're doing. And with that, I would like to say, comes a lot of stress, especially at this time when there's so much new things coming. Um, Next year, I think it'll be much easier because it'll be more familiar, but I'm not positive that the stress will be totally alleviated, but it will. So um, we're using our SLO feedback, our data, and all of those things to help us arrive at our lesson planning, our baseline. We're also um, committed to working on our Common Core, and we're sharing with our staff a book called When Kids Can't Read we'll be doing um, book talks with that with all of our staff members. Just to uh, summarize here, um, the building's been through uh, a rough year last year, having myself as the fifth principal that year. Of the building a lot of uh, mixed messages depending on whoever the principal was in the building, not only for the students but for the staff as well. And so for me, I'd like to get some small successes in there, get some common language throughout the building, whether it's our reading program and our goals, our math program and just focusing on number sense and honing in on it or character education and getting some common language throughout the building there. That's all for the students and, and good for the students but for the adults as well and the staff having that webinar that we broadcast to everybody so everybody's on the same page with expectations. Having those coffee talks and just getting everybody on the same page with what uh, my early goals here. Uh, we would like to see that growth emerge throughout the data as well and we'll be keeping our thumb on that. Uh, I've felt a lot of success in these first few months Time we do appreciate it. So. I just want to make a comment. I was down there about a month ago in the morning. Um, when you walk in a building, and I know Dr. Dice knows this too, if you walk into a building, um, you have a feel of what's going on in the building. You don't even have to talk to anybody. You can just observe. And what really impressed me was this is as the kids are coming in, students were coming in, they were excited. That is for your leadership down there, for students to come in and the staff to come in in the morning, because I know I wasn't that way. They were excited about going to their classroom, and I could tell they were ready to learn. That's, that's a great thing. Yeah.
senior year, uh, junior year at Lemoyne, I had to do this, uh, this study for my political science class at the computer, computer, computer building classroom. And I had to punch out a stack of cards like this to get it to calculate a few little things. I just noticed that I got an error message that that file referred to a shortcut. So um, <laughs> if we don't have the right one, I can ad lib. Okay, so we'll work the best we can. Um, I'm Nikki Slater. Um, I'm the House uh, 3 principal at Gillette Road Middle School. And this is Laura Connors. She's our RBC teacher. She's been our RBC chair for many years, and we really couldn't um, do any of this without her. She's very dedicated. Um, so, we're going to go over our goals for 2012, and this is not the right one. <laughs> so, we're going to have to switch here real quickly. We have part of our yes. yes. Do you guys? Yes, we have, you know the right we have the we right have one. one. We have the right one. We all have just, the right one. Yeah, we have the right one. We have the right one. With all the. All right, so we're <laughs> going to have to go from the paper copy. And we have key areas that we're focusing on um, this year. We're uh, focusing on instructional, instructional and teacher capacity, which is aligned to goal two in the strategic plan, increasing student performance, which is aligned to goal one, and character education and the Gillette Road Middle School culture, which will support goal one and two of the strategic plan. <laughs> Turn this part over to Laura and let her go ahead with that. I guess we chose to start with instructional focus and teacher capacity based on some success we had last year with beginning to have grade level and department meetings after school. And we've decided to formalize those into professional learning communities. The goal of a professional learning community is to first delve into the data that your community is in most need of analyzing and that's where we've started this year. So rather than just the data team and BPT delving into the data, all of our teachers have been involved in that process with guidance from data team members and BPT members and administration. Um, once they've delved into the data and selected performance indicators that they'd like to work on, the professional learning communities decide to use common assessments then they regroup and share student work based on those common assessments and discuss what is going well, what isn't going well. They determine what would be best practices to continue to make improvements in those performance indicators. And then they regroup once again, once a second common assessment has been given. So we're looking to really get into that process to teach teachers how professional learning communities are run, what the norms are for each of those meetings, and we're hoping to really formalize that by the end of this year. This was all based really on what our <clears throat> staff told us in the TEL survey that they really wanted us to be able to do. Uh, the most common um, low rated, 
I guess, indicator that we got was lack of common time, lack of time to work with uh, your teachers and professional learning communities are really the very best answer to that. Um, another thing that we learned from our staff in our own survey that we sent out to staff was that fear and concern over the APPR process is certainly at a height this year and it's important that our staff feel supported in that and administration, MBPT, and staff who participated in the piloting program last year have been wonderful in trying to offer support to all of our staff. So on the half day in October, we did spend some time reviewing the requirements and timelines of the APPR so that everybody got the same message on that. Our next goal is to increase student performance. Um, the assessments that you're looking there are New York State assessments and our current fifth grade students performed at a 70% proficiency level. Now that's actually on the fourth grade assessment. And so our goal for this coming school year is to raise that to 73% um, with a target goal of 80% by 2015. Our sixth grade, current sixth grade students uh, we're 64% proficient on the fifth grade assessment, and our goal is to reach 70% this year. Seventh grade, we're 69% proficient, and our goal is 73% proficiency. In all of those areas, we're expected to reach an 80% proficiency level by 2015. In our math, our current fifth graders scored were 78% proficient on their fourth grade assessment. Now that 2015 goal is actually 85%, so we would expect them to go to 80% this year and then slowly increase that to 85%. Our current sixth grade students, 71% of them were proficient uh, last year on the fifth grade assessment, and our goal is to reach 74% by the, uh, on the next assessment. Seventh grade students were 80% proficient, and again, that 2015 goal will be 85%. So this year, they will be 82% um, proficient. That's our goal for this year. And as Laura said, this year, um, we approached our data um, a little differently. Um, we started this summer just working with the data team and then decided that it would be beneficial if our teachers could actually go through that same process. So during the first grade level mean, meeting, the um, the data team kind of facilitated that and we asked the teachers to look at the data and come up with areas where they thought their students were really struggling. And what we discovered on the ELA, and this is actually um, in grades five, six, and seven, um, about 25% of those assessments in each of those years are focused on these tasks, these indicators, trying to find the main idea, stating, summarizing, using details to support ideas, making inferencing on the basis of explicit and implied information. So when we looked at those, so we kind of grouped those as one area where we really needed to focus on, there was, because the scores really were not um, in those areas, um, they were the lowest of all. So in general, 60% of our typical students um, were successful on those types of questions. And, and actually that percentage was probably more between around 58 or 59%. Uh, I rounded up. So, and then our students with disabilities, 35% um, of them were on average successful on those tasks and that percentage on those tasks ranged for them anywhere from maybe 30% um, to 37%. So we got an average of about 35%. So what did we talk about doing in ELA? We've discussed we're going to have some common graphic organizers so that all students will have some skills in those. Uh, we're going to be using common scoring rubrics and each of the teachers are going to be focusing on finding the, the details. Um, drawing conclusions, making inferences, and supporting compare and contrast. Um, I know that already at the grade level meetings, um, I can speak to fifth grade specifically, um, they all had a common um, a task, assignment, activity based on identifying the main idea. And the next meeting would be for them to have a discussion on how, how did those students 
um, do on that activity? How did they succeed? So that would be the next um, step for them. Now the math assessments are, um, they don't have as much of the same type of question from grade level to grade level because of the, the way, you know, math is delivered and each year you, they have to add another set of skills. But what we have found in general in, in fifth grade and actually sixth and seventh grade is that our students really, really have difficulty trying to decode word problems. Understanding what the words mean, understanding how to create a mathematical expression to solve that word problem. So all of our students really still struggle with that. It was a struggle last year and it continues to be a struggle. So um, they're going to um, focus on that again this year. Um, so in fifth grade, as we looked at the, um, the problems on the assessment, we discovered that 27% um, of our students with disabilities um, were able to successfully complete a, pro a problem um, that focused on, um, actually I believe it was on ratios. And then 65% of the students were, the typical students were successful. So there's quite a big um, difference uh, there between the two groups. Again, we're using common formative assessments. Teachers are gonna be analyzing student work and working on to teach common strategies to in increase the student's ability to decode those word problems. On sixth grade math, again, we found again, they're having a lot of trouble with identifying and decoding word problems. So for an exam example, in the sixth grade assessment, they had a, pro a word problem that related to uh, proportional reasoning. 15% of our students were dis with disabilities were successful in that area, and 47% of our typical students were successful. So you can see that's an area where we really need to focus our efforts, is trying to help students understand how to translate word problems into mathematical expressions. So they're gonna be having common, a set common tasks that align to the common core, and they're gonna continue to implement that throughout the school year and have a common rubric for assessing. It gets a little repetitious because we found the same thing in seventh grade. You are still having a problem, except now the problems become more difficult because now they're more multi-step problems. And the students really have a hard time with that higher order thinking, knowing which step to do first and which step to do second, and how do they, you know, get the right answer? How do they do that? Well, in the seventh grade assessment, on a word problem that required translating a two-step verbal expression into an algebraic expression, 47% of our typical students were successful and 12% of our students with disabilities were successful. So again, you can see that is one of our um, areas where we need to focus a, a tremendous amount of effort this year. And I think what um, is making this even a little bit more difficult is the math um, has changed so much from last year and what's required of the math teachers at the current fifth, sixth, and seventh grade levels um, is to focus on things that the kids don't have the basics for because they've changed the curriculum so much what they should have gotten sixth grade they didn't get but seventh grade is jumping in and trying to teach catch them up, but also trying to teach the new content. So um, the students are, are struggling in math this year. It's, it's quite um, a challenge for them. And let Laura go on with the, the fun stuff here. <laughs> overall, Gillette uh, got a really good rating on our TAL survey that the overall climate of the building and the feeling of staff being supported was at 96%. It was by far our very best performance indicator on the TEL survey, so we really feel that we just simply must continue that. One of the things that we know uh, in terms of the district and in terms of middle school especially is that there's a lot of transitions for kids, and the district does a wonderful job of trying to prepare our students, but we felt that at Gillette we could do an even better job of really making sure that students are supported in their own transitions. So we changed the opening day for seventh grade. And instead of having an extended homeroom of about an hour, they actually spent the day with their homeroom teachers. 
They walked around the building and they toured the building. They took personal surveys so that every seventh grade teacher, whether it be their health teacher, their phys ed teacher, their science teacher, could get data on these children's perceived strengths and weaknesses, their goals for the year, their likes and their dislikes. And as you know, in the APPR, one of the really key points is that teachers need to get to know their students. Speaking as a fifth grade teacher, it's a little easier, I believe, at the elementary level to do that. For seventh grade teachers who may be seeing these children only for 10 weeks and have to cram all their curriculum into that, there isn't a ton of time built into their own schedules to do that. So we felt that this new opening day uh, procedure for seventh grade would really not only benefit the students but also benefit the teachers in terms of getting to know those students, making those students feel very much that they still have a home base even though they're in seventh grade and they're transitioning to seeing a lot more teachers and not being within just a team, a small team of teachers. We will continue to work on our um, character ed that we already have in place, star students, the recognition, that every single teacher, including special area teachers, are recognizing students for key characteristics that the district set, such as responsibility and trustworthiness. We will continue to have the student-run I Make a Difference Committee. These students actively participate in getting not only fundraising going for the staff and for students, but also for creating posters, for uh, allowing kids during the half days. We have also targeted half days not just to apply to staff development but also to student development. So the October 31st half day for our students was actually an anti-bullying day. That was run primarily by our I Make a Different Student Committee. So it's really empowering for our kids and it helps all of our students. So we're very, very proud of that, of that at Gillette and feel that it's very important to continue those things. Our next area is the Gillette Road Middle School Culture. <laughs> we'll explain the picture in a minute. I think we should start with the picture. Start with the picture? Yeah. Okay. Um, really and truly, I think everyone in this room can relate to the amount of stress that all of us in education are under. And so we decided on the October 31st half day to host lunch for the staff. Our administrators were incredibly generous in providing that. And we had some games, such as pumpkin bowling, and on the pins we may have labeled them with things that we wish we could just knock down for good. <laughs> but no, 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 we're going to tackle them instead. But, you know, just for fun and kicks, we decided we'd knock them over with pumpkins. Really and truly, our administration has made a huge effort in making feel, staff feel supported allowing staff to ask questions. Staff has really stepped up. Those of us who feel we have certain strengths have offered to help other staff members who maybe don't feel that they're comfortable writing lesson plans or with some of the technology integration. And I really feel that it's done a lot to alleviate stress for staff. Fun too. Uh -huh. <laughs> if that's allowed. That is allowed. Fun is always so, allowed. Always allowed. Um, so again, for this year, we're going to continue our communication <coughs> with our staff, um, make sure we have building activities for um, community building. Everyone um, have our, ex our, sh our staff with expertise share, and of course, we have a new um, committee formed, a DASA committee that's already been extremely active. Have any, um, questions that they'd like to address to us? Um, one question is um, to Laura, and I've done this before, Laura, so I'm putting you on the spot of all the schools. <laughs> You're a dynamic teacher. I know that. You spend a lot of time with your students. You have your family at home. You've got this new API. How much time do you spend as building chair? round off the amount of time you spent is building chair besides these other duties that you have so it's it's a large number it's, it, it is yeah. I feel like if you're going to do it right you do have to spend a lot of time my administrators are incredibly supportive but yes we will hole up in a room before half days we will hole up in a room to plan 
the grade level meetings. But the hope is that once we train teachers about professional learning committees or communities, that that would subside some of that. But yes, it's it's a Very huge dedicated. responsibility, but it's also one that I welcome and I feel has great merit and benefit to all of my staff and to my kids. So it's well worth the time. Another question, I see Barb's in the audience and also Dave's still here. How many, how much, how, how do you get together as middle schools so that we have a co consolidation of our program? Do you get, how often do you, monthly, weekly, do you get together as middle schools to talk about the program? I'll put you on the spot. Well, it could be both. It could be both. How about your building planning teams? We have the... Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you, you guys. In the participation in government students, if you're out there, come on up and we'll sign your forms for you. Not like last week. Last week. Anyone can sign them. Come on right up. Get a pen here. There you go. You're welcome. Same to you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Dan Common Core. Good evening. Um, I believe it was earlier in the in the season, there were some questions about SLOs and Common Core, and we've had a lot of BPT presentations, so trying to weave some things in. Uh, I'm going to get a time to uh, talk a little bit about the Common Core. You've seen it uh, referred to in many of the presentations, so I'm just going to use the ELMO and have a few, little bit of discussion. Now, the Common Core, the Board of Regents adopted the new B through 12 Common Core Learning Standards for ELA and Literacy and Math back in January of 2011. Um, they are phasing it in and incorporating it into three through eight state assessments in ELA and mathematics. One of the things the Common Core Learning Standards uh, is doing, it serves as a consistent set of expectations for what the students should know and be able to do um, that will ensure that every student is on track for college and career readiness. Last year, we spent a lot of time in professional development with unpacking the Common Core Learning Standards with all teachers. Uh, in March 2012, the Professional Development Day was dedicated solely to inform all teachers on the Common Core and the instructional shifts. And we also, for those people that had been coming to the district office, um, professional development was provided by BOCES to teachers, and we had uh, teachers here in Mass um, that were the represent representatives uh, to learn more about the Common Core and then bring that back to the buildings. Uh, there was at least 40 people at a time where between that and ELA and Mass scoring, parking was kind of limited here at the district office. Um, common go core goals need to be aligned with college and work expectations. They need to be clear, need to be rigorous, build upon the strengths and lessons of, of current state standards. And they're being informed by the top performing countries so that all students are prepared to succeed in the global economy and society. And I'm going to be referring to that uh, a little bit later as I just have a, uh, the discussion. Um, I think you've seen some of these 
uh, slides before in regard to the six shifts in ELA given the Common Core, talking about balancing informational and uh, literary text, knowledge and discipline. Uh, Text-based answers is uh, a, a huge part of the Common Core and writing from sources and academic vocabulary. But it doesn't end just in ELA. In math, there's uh, six shifts as well. The focus, coherence, fluency, and I'm going to just show you and this slide here, and I'm going to try to see if we can maybe zoom in a little bit more. When they talk about, and I'm just going to take maybe uh, shift number four in ELA, text-based answers. Questions will require students to, um, I can't say, marshal evidence from the text, um, include the paired passage from paired passages, taking two different passages and be able to um, take information from text and come up with a synthesized answer. So what's being incorporated into teachers' lessons are uh, in ELA and math, all these different changes as they were talking in the previous BPT programs um, that teachers are incorporating into their lessons on a regular basis. An intense focus on complex, grade appropriate nonfiction. Um, nonfiction has been a huge shift, especially at the high school, um, where it used to be about an 80 20, where there'd be more fiction to nonfiction. Um, what they're expecting our students to do is almost a complete reversal, especially in high school, where they want students to be able to take information from uh, a manual, a uh, newspaper, articles, and be able to synthesize the information. As well as in math, um, more central standards. Um, and one of the things that uh, they are talking about teachers doing is instead of going a mile wide and an inch deep, going deeper into uh, the concepts and not trying to cover everything. There was curriculum uh, work that was done in math, ELA, science, and social studies uh, this summer around the Common Core. Um, we also uh, spent time trying to do some vertical alignment, um, going, taking grades um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 through 12, putting them all in the same room and having them look at their information and then have th that dialogue, that discussion that you were hearing uh, from some of the buildings as far as what's happening in the grade either before or below them. And uh, we had both these workshops in the Common Core and they continue. In fact, um, we were just at uh, BCIC, which is a curriculum council at BOCES, and they were telling us about uh, a new Common Core uh, workshop that's going to be very helpful that's coming out in December and within a day's time I had probably 15 requests coming from teachers uh, because it is that valuable. Some of the other things about the Common Core for other subject areas and the one thing that um, if you ever have a chance there is a website called Engage New York and it has a plethora of information that we regularly recommend that our teachers, administrators go to because they are currently providing updates as the state is making changes and also giving examples. So um, you'll see some of the things that come up. Sometimes they may change from month to month as to where the state is. But um, as far as plans for science and social studies, those are still being worked on. Um, Recommendation is to infuse the literacy standards for history, social studies, science, technical subjects um, into the areas. Uh, the intent is that all educators become responsible for developing literacy for all students. So as you were seeing uh, that uh, Smith Road when you were talking about Mrs. Maloney, so what's happening in building planning teams, the phys ed teacher, the art teacher, the music teacher, Everyone is looking at what the goals are and in incorporating literacy and math into uh, their content area. Uh, one of the things I did is I did go on to Engage New York and I started to pull a few slides and the board doesn't have this in your packet. I pulled this this weekend. But um, on the left it talks about graduation under the current requirements and all students, and this is uh, national information, are at 74%. Under the new standards 
for all students. And this is graduating with a score of 75 or more on uh, Regents in English or an 80 or more on math. And the far right shows the breakdown um, by the uh, all students and then by the different subgroups. As far as the Common Core, this is one of the reasons why there was such a push. And it talks about the U.S. has fallen from first place to 13th place in high school graduation among international competitiveness. And with the uh, incorporation of all the technology, it is not just central New York, it's not just New York State, it's not just this country. Our students are competing with students all over the world. And what uh, was seen is that we really need to up our game as far as what we're providing for our students so they can be successful. One also talks about international competitiveness and there has been a decline in relative positions of U.S. Uh, so from second to 15th among those students graduating from college and universities. So looking at these numbers, it, 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 it's shocking and that's why there was such a push to um, make sure that we are trying to make sure our students are prepared. These are three areas of instructional shifts that the core is demanding. That there is a focus strongly where the standards are, think across grades and link the major topics within grades and the big part is the rigor. The expectation and as you look at examples if you do go on Engage New York, um, some of the questions you would see are, were used to be very literal. Now they are multi-step questions and answers um, that our students are being asked to do and a large part of that not only in ELA but also in math you have to have a, a good handle on uh, your literacy to be able to do a lot of the the math uh, questions that are being asked of students. I put this on here because again this was uh, an area for that focus with math and it says uh, in the burgundy move away from mile wide inch deep curricula identified in the TIMS. So again, with math and ELA, they're trying to make sure we're not teaching all these different concepts. Let's focus on several concepts that we know that students need to be successful as they move on and make sure they know them in detail. When we talk about those key areas of focus, if we look K2, addition and subtraction, three through five, multiplication, division, whole numbers, fractions, sixth grade ratios and proportions, seventh ratios, proportion and reasoning, and eighth grade linear algebra and linear functions. I can continue. I have several that we pulled from Engage New York, but I think you're, you're getting the, the gist of it is not the same old as what we used to do. And what we're doing also right now is uh, Mrs. Wolchinski and, and I are, are will be working on, again, forming some other groups to work on aligning the assessments to make sure the formative assessments are tightly aligned to the Common Core so that um, what we assess, we can get a real good picture of what students know and are able to do at that current state and then have the teachers spend time with reteaching or making sure those concepts are solidified because we want to make sure by the end of each grade level we can put a rubber stamp that each and every student knows this set of concepts and this set of skills before they move on to the next grade because in order for our students to be competitive at the next level we need to ensure that we do many of these things at this time because uh, when you see 74 percent under the current for college and career readiness and it dropped down to 34 percent when you start to look at those students that needed at least a 75 on the ELA regions and an 80 on the math. Uh, thank you for asking uh, us to follow up with those questions. I know SLOs were last week, and I am awaiting any questions if there are any. If I go on to engage New York, hmm? will I find test questions that are going to be given to a fourth grader or a third grader this um, year? As far as test questions, no, you won't be able to. I, 
you know, and it I talked about this at every that. board meeting, and I'm probably going to talk about it for the next two years. So I have a concern about these new tests. I see Dave, Dave, Dave's um, goals of 80%, yet we're giving not the same test. We're not going to give the same test. We already put these students, K through 8, through 90 minutes. Now we're going to make the questions even harder. Well, they have taken the listening portion away okay. uh, from the test, which is... Yeah, but the you, you, you've, you've, you've answered my question when you said, now we're not going to do literal. We're going to be doing analytical and interpretive and, and those kind of questions. I have no problem with that. But when I was teaching fourth grade, I could go back and you sample questions, and but I worked with my students daily on how to take a test and do that. Our teachers don't have that privilege. And I, I, I mean, that test is going to be very difficult for an 8-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 10-year-old. I just have a concern about it. It's too quick. It's too fast. And God bless the teachers in this district and the administrators for what you're doing. Um, but my other thing is, what are we doing for the parents? I know this is on the website, um, but we need to probably do, as we did when the test came out back in the 80s, we need to do some kind of um, workshop for parents. I do remember back in the 80s when I was teaching uh, at Bear Road when it first came out, the number of parents that came to that was huge the first year. This is new, and parents need to be aware of it. No, that's wonderful feedback uh, that uh, we can incorporate that. That is good to know, and I bet there's a lot of parents out there that um, would like to know the changes and the shifts, so um, we will be sitting down and discussing that with our administrators. Well, actually, we have. Uh, through the work that Valerie is doing, we're going to be um, administering a parent survey to um, identify various workshops an interest that our parents have so that we can begin to kick off our parent university model that I've talked about um, in the past, but that is also um, listed in our strategic plan. Uh, on top of that, uh, the schools are very much aware of uh, the issue that you've brought up, and so they too are not necessarily waiting to see what the survey, um, what information the survey provides, but they are taking the lead on trying to expose parents to various things that they know will be beneficial to supporting their students at home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, routine action items, are there any questions or discussion on those items? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. We have um, no comments from the audience this evening. Do we have any board committee reports or comments? Let's see just, you go first. Yeah, uh, just that our next uh, meeting of the policy committee is on. I just have some comments. Um, I noticed in a classroom the mission statement, the vision, um, I thought was excellently done. We voted for it as a board. I'd like to have a copy of that if it's each board member. I know we got it through the... Um, through email and so forth, but if we could have a nice copy laminated, I, I would like to carry that with me of the mission and the vision. So we're, sure. Okay. <laughs> we're having uh, some. Um, I, I think it's out here. I've seen print, it. Right. We yeah. only have like a sample. That's okay. a sample. And so once we get um, the batch, everyone in the district will be provided with a copy. I'm not sure if it will be an 8 by 11. That's what you're asking for, an 8 by 11? Okay, okay. The other thing is, in our um, on-board uh, newspaper today, um, there's an excellent article, and I'll bring it up at the Legislative Committee meeting tomorrow, um, the dates of what a school needs to do. I'd like to have that on the website um, so that parents can see exactly like what February 15th is, March 1st, April 2nd, 6th. Don knows what I'm talking about. If we could have that on the website so parents can actually see what leads up to um, a school vote, that, that would be great. Um, went to a band banquet on Friday. Um, each of you got a, a brochure on it. Um, it's probably one of the best banquets, wouldn't you say, Kay? One of the best banquets um, that our school district has. Um, the director of the marching band, Mr. Mayo, singly 
uh, talks about each senior um, for about 10 minutes and honors each senior that's in the band or in the visual ensemble. I think that's awesome. Um, again, our parents work very hard uh, with this organization and it showed at the appreciation banquet. Another thing is I open up, I, you know, when I'm retired, I can read a lot. Um, in the uh, Penny Saver, one of our teachers was named Teacher of the Year, Shirley Ware, a family consumer science teacher at CNS, um, named by the New York State Affiliate of the American Association of Family Consumer Science as Teacher of the Year in New York, and she's going to go on and compete nationally. This woman does a fantastic job in her classroom. She writes grants, another one that goes beyond in the classroom. Um, Kudos to her. Um, that is about it. Anyone else? Dr. Dice? Thank you. <laughs> I didn't touch we, any of your eyes. I know. We, okay. we, we, work we work together. We are definitely a team. Uh, and so it's great to uh, look at the brochure for uh, the appreciation banquet for the marching band. Um, at the time in which the marching band um, event was going on. Uh, some of us were also attending the military honor roll. It was our first um, event uh, of many more to come. It was an amazing event. Thank you to Mr. Bowles and his team for putting on an excellent event. Thank you to the high school for hosting us. Uh, I think all of the participants had a great time um, and they truly felt appreciated and we uh, appreciate them. On Saturday I had the privilege of speaking at uh, the grand opening for Gigi's Playhouse, and kudos to Michael and Ali uh, D'Onofrio. Uh, that was a vision and a dream um, that um, they had, and um, it is now a reality. And for anyone who has uh, did not was not able to attend the grand opening, it is an amazing place. Um, you walk in there, and uh, just it brightens your world. And so. Uh, please take the opportunity to go and at least check out uh, the, the location and just see all that it has to offer. Our students are extremely lucky to have uh, the opportunity to be able to have that kind of um, organization and um, place within their district, and we're hoping to build a relationship and partnership with them where we can have students volunteering their time. Also, kudos to the teachers who have already volunteered their time to get uh, Gigi's Playhouse off the ground. Between the artwork and the uh, donations from people in the community and those who donated time to paint, um, it just was a community affair, like I said, with uh, the vision um, in uh, one person's head and you could see all of the love and emotion that was um, coming through her as she was talking about it on Saturday um, and just being able to walk in there and say, you know, this is what I had in my head and here it is, uh, was a great thing. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge Juliana Marulo and Anthony Bernard. They are students at Smith Road in Mrs. Gangloff and Marzullo's class. Uh, those two students participated in a debate prior to the presidential election, and they did a phenomenal job. Uh, also, I've had the opportunity, as always, to continuously uh, visit classrooms, and we continue to hear how stressed our teachers are, and we continue to um, see that even with that stress, they are doing the best possible job that they can do to ensure that our students receive a quality program. Uh, they're engaging, um, they're smiling, um, and they're doing some great things in our classrooms. And so uh, kudos to our teachers, and last but not least, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you. Pat, I just have one comment I want to just chime in I apologize um, with the military honor roll there are three people that I do want to recognize um, that were behind the scenes one is Lori Cook our publicist did an awful lot of work with the program and just when the names were coming into the district so there was a lot of coordination on her part also my secretary Linda Pedersen uh, did a phenomenal job just as things were coming from Lori and coordinating but the, the last person I do want to recognize is uh, Mr. Dan Curry 
if you go up to the high school and see the job that That's he right, did he built the, um, as I, far as that showcase, that showcase it yeah. is absolutely exquisite and I know he'll yell at me later but I do want to make sure that uh, I, I say kudos to him because he did a phenomenal job with that you told me that that it, it was Bill Brown's vision and they worked together to actualize the vision which I, I couldn't make it up there, but I did get to see it, and and PM. Yep. I tried to beg him to stay that night, and he is an unsung hero. He he wanted to, be, and he's gonna he's gonna come back to me because of mentioning his name. But it is that uh, quality work and that dedication. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware. Put something, his plaque or something, built by. Yeah, we could do that. We can do that. That's a great it's idea. That's that a great idea. Yeah. I'm not so sure that he didn't do the one. Oh, he he, he did. No, he did. I know. I know that he did. <laughs> yeah. I know because I was part of the original Apple Muffin game. I I just I designed their shirt, and Dan and Carl Siley were like this, and Dan did that for us. Yes. But that's a great idea, Kay. So we'll look to do something. I designed the shirt. Huh? I designed that shirt. You designed it, oh, but it's my shirt. Yeah, no, that, that the drawing. The I designed drawing, the, the drawing print. on the shirt. You did a wonderful job. And we did the, with the wagons, yeah. We, so, we, Dan, uh, let's look into I, I that. Those oh, yeah. things, okay. his name should be on yep. everything. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that. That's great. Please, Good idea. You. That's a great idea. Okay, uh, routine action items. Uh, can I have a motion to take them as a group? George and Scott. George first, Scott second. Um, recommended action is to approve A, B, C, and D as submitted. Do we need to vote for that, or you're going to amend it and we'll vote? Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous. Um, advanced placement results. <laughs> Quality. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That's all this is just a, a simple little report. Honey, sir. <laughs> um, you all have this. You have it in color. I've got it in uh, black and white because it's just a discussion item, not a presentation. So uh, I'll just go through this. Um, so what I've given you here in this table is um, the AP results. These are uh, exams that um, kids take in the spring. Um, the courses that we teach, and actually uh, there is a calculus course, this B course right here that we don't teach the course but the student is eligible to take the exam which I think is pretty amazing um, you'll see up at the top greater than or equal to a three is uh, considered a passing score in AP they're graded on a one through five scale I used to teach AP biology so I'm pretty familiar with the AP course um, as a and then you can see the total number of students you know over time that have taken these exams so I arranged it just in some graphical form for you um, and I want to give you just a little bit of breakdown that's in the uh, the cover memo. Um, the enrollment has increased by 16 students overall. That That's not a significant jump, but it does tell us that we've remained steady. Because remember that enrollment um, has declined. So to see a 16 student increase in very challenging courses, you know, is, is that a total number for courses or total? Total number for taking the exam. Yeah. Give us a number. I, I, I most kids take three, four of these. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Not individual yet. Individual students. Individual students. 
the students that are in repeat. Yes. Okay, sure. That takes a little bit of digging, but I, I, I can get that for you. It. Yes, I can do it. <laughs> he wouldn't have asked you if he didn't She'll think do it I could do it. Than a day, he I knows that I could do it. Less than a day? <laughs> no, less than a day. <laughs> yep. It's been kind of a challenging. Oh, never mind. Okay. She loves it. Yes, I do. Um, and then this is the number of, or the percent of students that are scoring three or higher on the AP exams. Um, and you can see that it's a three year history, just important to, you know, we've gone up in some areas and, and down in a few others. Um, our highest performing exams for last year was uh, that calculus BC and, and I sort of tongue in cheek put on the cover memo that the enrollment was small. It was one student. Um, the student scored very well, so might as well put it on there. Um, also the art classes that we teach, um, we have several uh, that fall within the art category. They, the students do very well. Macroeconomics, I've never taken it, have no idea what it is, but the kids do very well in it. Um, and English 11, which doesn't surprise me at all since we have such a high passing rate on the English uh, regions. Um, and the lowest performing exams are uh, psychology, which has been pretty steady. I'm not really familiar with that test. Um, and then statistics, which took a little bit of a dip uh, this year. Um, Melissa was sitting next to me and um, says that she's going to look into that further to find out, you know, why there was a dip um, in the statistics course. That's a hard exam, so we'll see. I also, just to let you know, um, when I get the score report from uh, the guidance counselors, I also get some of the um, comparative results as far as New York State goes. I know Bob usually asked me for um, comparative results, so I was just circling where we have beat the state on the mean score, several exams, the art courses, English language, uh, composition, macroeconomics, U.S. government, U.S. history, world history, and the calculus BC. That's lots of exams where we have beat the state median average, so that's something to be quite proud of. Questions on that? That program has grown. Uh... We really encourage kids to, to tackle these courses and, and to try these exams. And like I said, I, I taught it for 13 years. They are very challenging curriculums. Curricula? Last student. Hey, discussion action item A is the contract between the North Syracuse Central School District. Sure. Recently, we reached a tentative agreement with the teacher aid bargaining unit after just a few um, sessions. The teacher aid unit ratified the contract a couple of weeks ago, and we're asking the board to ratify that tonight. Questions? Question? The action is to approve that contract. Um, teacher aid bargaining unit for a period of July 1st, 2012 through June 30th, 2015. Bob, second. Rizzio, all in favor? Yes. Appointment of a Section 75 hearing officer. Recently, the board preferred charges against a transportation bargaining unit member, and it's required by the civil service law. We're asking the board tonight to appoint a hearing officer. Question. Recommended action is to approve the resolution to appoint the hearing officer. Second, Mike D'Onofrio, all in favor? Also. Also. Sure. Um, at the last board meeting, we asked the board to create a temporary typist position. The resolution at that time read typist 2. It should have been typist 1. The duties are more in line associated with the typist 1. And we're just asking you to, to amend that and make that change tonight. I, sorry. Any questions on that? Recommended action is to approve that resolution as submitted. Mike D'Onofrio, second Sandy. All in favor? That's unanimous also. Item D is the request to approve permission for North Syracuse Central School District student to be an independent athlete with the Manlius Pebble Hill. Uh, occasionally uh, during the course of, uh, of years when someone participates in a sport and we don't have that sport here, we occasionally do that. Uh, are there any questions? Motion is to uh, approve permission for uh, Ms. Alexis, K Alexis Kane to be an independent athlete in the ski race team at the Families Pebble Hill. Scott made the motion. Second, George. All in favor? Also. Uh, personnel 
Uh, do we need um, an executive session before we take up these items? I have a motion to take um, items A, B, and C as a group. First, Sandy. Second, Michael Marizio. Uh, recommended action is to approve A, acknowledge B, approve C as submitted. All in favor? Also, I would like to at this time make a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of hearing a parental appeal <coughs> Excuse me, of a superintendent's decision to receive an update on negotiations relative to the North Syracuse Academic Directors Association, North Syracuse Principals Association, <coughs> excuse me, and the North Syracuse Teaching Assistance and LPN Bargaining Unit, to review two legal matters relative to potential litigation and to review the employment record of one individual with action to follow on one legal matter. Second. George, all in favor? Unanimous and we're adjourned. Thank you.